Good morning, everyone. Praise God for the lovely, beautiful snow we've been having this week and that the roads are clear this Sunday so that we can gather together and worship. Um, probably a lot of people were trapped at home on Tuesday. I think we spent our Tuesday at home with all the snow that was out, but it was very, very beautiful. Um, I'm so thankful for, for His grace to allow us to be able to meet together this morning. Let's be in prayer for the weather, though, because we got some more coming up, and I know that uh, the school has various needs for classes in the morning. Um, I have a card to read to you this morning. This is from Clarita and her family, and it says, Dear Country Church family, on behalf of Anita Soriano's family, Kyle, Jonas, and Anna Lynn, we would like to express our gratitude for all your prayers, your heartfelt condolences mean so much in our time of grief. The beautiful plant basket is very much appreciated. For the family to have a place for the funeral dinner was of much comfort. Thank you for the privilege of being able to utilize the fellowship hall for that purpose. The Lord bless you for your love and kindness. Thank you so much, Clarita and family. And thank you too, Clarita, for sharing this card with us. Uh, this week, I got an encouraging call from a friend, and they were sharing with me how they like to call other people just to encourage them. They're one of those who aren't able to get out and about very much these days. And cards like this, phone calls like uh, the one I received from her just reminded me, as we emphasized discipleship earlier this year, that there are all kinds of creative ways that we can go about encouraging other believers, showing them love. Uh, so even this last week when we were I shut in on our homes. I didn't do as much of it as I could have, but I, I tried to do a little extra calling. And when we're trapped at home, we can still find ways to encourage with, with wonderful messages from cards and phone calls and practice discipleship that way. Well, in a moment, we're going to have a missions moment. We're going to get an update from the Workman family. Excited to see that. But first, let's open in prayer. Dear God, uh, we just ask that you would be with us this morning. Help us, Lord, in your Holy Spirit to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, fill our minds and our hearts with wonder and worship as we lift up our voices to you in praise. Um, Lord, help us as we spend time in your word to come away changed. Lord, we pray for this missions moment time coming up. Help us, Lord, to become burdened and passioned for seeing the, the Bible, your word spread throughout the world uh, as a witness to all nations of your beauty and goodness and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, the missions committee reached out to the workmen to get an update on how they were doing, and we asked for a short video and they were happy to make one for us, so we're going to show that in just a minute. You may also remember the workmen from this uh, excellent storyboard that Jenny uh, put up downstairs uh, a couple months ago. It's a, it's a great, uh, a lot of information and nice pictures on there uh, to give you, an, a, an, a, give you a, a feeling for how it's like to live in South Africa, where, where the workmen are and how they are trying to learn a new language. I think many of us have had a chance to meet the workmen's in person. They are one of our more, more recent missionary partnerships. Um, our church connection with the workmen began about five years ago. And prior to that, the church had uh, been supporting uh, another missionary that was working with Wycliffe. And that missionary was retired at the time. In 2015, Jesse and Stephanie Workman met with Pastor Blake, who was the interim pastor of our church, and they met at a Wycliffe banquet. Um, not long after that, the workmen visited our church for the first time, and we began, shortly after that, we began supporting them financially. Wycliffe is an organization whose purpose is to translate Bibles into languages of people groups who do not have a Bible. And it's a great organization, and you may have remembered from Pastor Aaron a couple of weeks ago, he gave us some details about what they did during, during his sermon. Um, 
Bible translation into the, these languages is, is a very difficult task. It can take a really long time because often these languages are not documented. There's no written record of the languages, so you have to start from the very beginning, and that is by learning the language from a native speaker who may not speak English very well, if at all. It takes a lot of faith to do what the workmen have done. I remember talking to them the last time they were here, which was in 2019. We had a meal for them after church, and I sat next to them, and I must have asked Jesse a hundred questions. And we were, we were some of the last Americans that they saw before they left for South Africa. In fact, after they left our church, they were headed to the airport to start a 24-hour trip to South Africa. When they arrived there, they had a motel room for just a couple of days. They had no permanent housing lined up. So you can imagine the amount of faith that took to, to do that, to make that journey, uh, to take a young family and start a new life in a new culture in a very different place. Additionally, last year, of course, COVID presented other challenges for them, but the workmen have, been, have remained faithful and remained dedicated to the translation effort. They've been very good in communicating with our church. We receive uh, newsletters and emails from them regularly. They're very thankful for our support. And Jesse told me last week that our church has the highest level of interest and participation in their ministry of all their partners. So they are very, very thankful for our support in our ministry. So with that, I was uh, share the video now, and I think you'll find it a very sweet video of a sweet family um, out there on the mission field. Molweni nonke. Molweni nonke. We're the Workman family. I'm Jesse. I'm Stephanie. I'm Aiden. I'm Sophia. I'm Molly. I'm Patty. <laughs> and we're here in Cape Town, South Africa, where we have been serving with Wycliffe Bible Translators since October 2019, so almost a year and a half now. We are very thankful for your ongoing prayerful and financial support of our family and wanted to give you a quick update. So here in South Africa, uh, I'm serving in the role of translation consultant in training. If you'd like to know more about what specifically a translation consultant does, feel free to reach out to me at the contact info at the end of this uh, video. Uh, but I just wanted to share about some of the things that I've been involved with over the past year. Um, so three main areas. Uh, the first is uh, language learning. So I've been studying the, and learning the Isi Kosa language, which is a national language here in South Africa, and it's spoken widely in our community. Uh, I've been working on that since December of 2019 and continue to do that regularly um, now. Uh, the second area is working with and observing mm. translation teams. Um, so had a few opportunities to do that. Um, it's been virtual, you know, all this is taking place virtually right now, which is not ideal, but it's better than nothing. And, uh, you know, we're making the most of the circumstances uh, because of that. Uh, but more recently, I've been observing on a regular basis the South African Sign Language Translation Project here in Cape Town. Uh, and that's been a very valuable experience as well. Uh, the third area uh, is continuing to study um, biblical languages, uh, which is important for a translation consultant. And my main role right now is to homeschool the kids. Um, part of that is also doing some language learning. We are also learning EC Kosa once a week, and we are involved in some extracurricular activities like um, a homeschool field trip group and some sports and things like that. Um, as you can imagine, the pandemic has made our first term here look very, very different than we had anticipated, and it's been really difficult because we have had some very severe restrictions on the things that we can do and the places that we can go, which makes it really difficult to connect with people, especially being new here, and to be able to get out and practice the language that we're learning and things like that as well. So we would just uh, ask that you would uh, pray for a few different things. Uh, first of all, for us, uh, we pray that you would just pray for perseverance and contentment under these present circumstances. Um, like we said, has been a bit of a challenge. It's not at all what we expected out of the past year, uh, just like all of you, I'm sure, uh, feel the same way. Um, but pray for us in that way. Pray also for the country of South Africa and for our leaders here, um, that they would make wise decisions. Uh, we've been blessed uh, to have a relatively low caseload here in South Africa, uh, but it's been difficult for the country as well. Um, so pray that the, the situation would loosen uh, sooner rather than later. Um, and that we would be able to just make the most of the time 
Uh, and then finally, pray for us as we uh, begin to make preparations to return to the U.S. next year, in 2022. Uh, it's a big task, and uh, we are beginning those kind of talks and discussion. We just ask for your prayers for that. So we want to say thank you, and, uh, and we are thankful for your, your prayer and financial support. And uh, we just uh, want to say, stay well. Salani kakushe. Salani kakushe. Thanks for doing the mission moment. Uh, it's very interesting to see and hear from our missionaries. So I'm sure that's going to continue for a while. I appreciate that. Well, again, welcome. Glad you're here with us and uh, trust you've had a good week. And uh, I know a week or so ago, Pastor said I kind of th stole his thunder about his sermon. Well, he took mine today because I was going to comment about the snow, <laughs> how beautiful it has been uh, just uh, you know, wake up, waking up in the morning, if you get in, you know, I don't sleep much, but uh, so I'm up at sunrise most of the time and to see the sunrise and, and the beauty of that snow. And I know we don't like it so much, but wow, just to look out and look at your trees or and see all that uh, stuff that's on there. It's just so beautiful. So uh, I'm thankful. And I know you are too, that we can know the one who has created all that. And we don't worship the creation, but we do worship the creator. And uh, I'd like you to join us in song again, please.
I have an interesting little story to share with you this morning. And at first, it's going to sound kind of mundane, and you're maybe going to wonder where I'm going with it. But uh, a while ago, maybe not all of you heard this, maybe not even all of you were going here at the time, I was talking about um, how we want to be in a state of prayer and praying about more matters than just our food or just before bed and that sort of thing. And I gave as an example how oftentimes on a Sunday morning I will pray about what I'm going to wear. And I, in conclusion, naturally feel led toward more bright colors in order to encourage people. Well, here I am today, I'm wearing something very drab. Um, and I've owned this, this combination outfit for, I don't know, at least a year now. And, uh, I don't usually wear it together because that, the combination of a brown top and a green bottom and they're just dirt, earth kind of tones, um, I feel isn't very encouraging. But for some reason, I, when I looked at my closet this morning, I was like, this, this is what I'm going to put on at last. I'm going to put on this outfit. And it sounds silly. It sounds silly, right? But then after I put it on and got my belt on, I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, I look like I'm in the army today. You know, it's like um, uh, it's an army, army uniform type outfit. And I looked it up online and actually it's the reverse. You're supposed to have like a green top and more of the khaki pants if you're in the army dress uniform. But I was like, I'm, it's army day. And I didn't even realize it. Well, guess what, folks? We're in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 24 today, and it's Army Day in God's Word. And um, to me, it just kind of struck me as odd that I didn't realize, really, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it in those terms, um, that here I would kind of dress up in, in, in an outfit that looks reminds me of an Army dress uniform on a day that we would be preaching on the whole Army of God, and, uh, or the whole armor of God and uh, the kind of spiritual warfare that we were involved in. But it, it, it linked into a reminder to me that, you know, for believers, whether we realize it or not, every day is Army Day. We are part of a, a spiritual uh, army, and we are in the midst of a spiritual conflict. And whether we are realizing that that conflict is raging or not, it is raging. And if we aren't realizing it, if we aren't preparing ourselves for it, if we aren't armoring ourselves well, then it can lead, just like in a physical war, it can lead to disaster. Unpreparedness in combat, walking into um, a, a war zone without your weapon, without your Kevlar, without your helmet, complete disaster. And so we as believers, though, often are going to be facing spiritual warfare and how often do we walk out into our day not wearing our Kevlar or our rifle or our helmet or whatever on that particular day? And it can lead to disaster when we don't because we're in a spiritual war. Uh, there's light versus darkness going on, God versus the devil, righteousness versus sin, good versus evil. So here we are. We're going to finish Ephesians today, and we're going to finish it with some of the best verses in Ephesians. And we're going to be talking about the spiritual war that believers are a part of, and how we are to prepare for it, and how we are to fight it. Let's pray, and then we will dig in. Dear God, we pray that you would help us in understanding your word today, but more than that, in applying it to our lives. Lord, help us to be aware of the dangers to our spiritual health, the battle that is going on for souls, the cruel adversary that we uh, must stand against, armored. Help us, Lord, not to go through our life um, unprepared for the things that we might face. Help us, Lord, to go forward in your strength, armored in your armor, so that we are always ready, ready to stand firm and make a stand on the evil day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. 
Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who, are, all who love our Lord Jesus Christ, with love incorruptible. So God's word is clear. We have spiritual forces of evil that are set against us. Powerful forces that have measures of rule and authority even over the cosmos itself, called rulers and authorities. It's possible, even we find from other places in God's Word, that it's possible for believers even to be attacked directly by the devil himself. But the devil is not like God, able to be all places at all times, knowing all things. He walks about, though, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and that's in part because he is not able to spread his attentions in infinite directions like God is. He is opportunistic, prowling, looking for opportunities to attack. Believers need to take up the whole armor of God in order to withstand the evil day, precisely because the devil's attentions toward us will come and go. It's not every day. He's not able to do that, praise the Lord. But there will be evil days and there will be good days because our foe is not omnipotent. Because our foe is not omnipotent, all-powerful, the Bible has this to say, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil flees those who resist him because he doesn't have the time and energy to endlessly focus upon them. He will move on and try to influence somebody that he can have an easier time with. Just like a lion. Uh, when lions are on the hunt, they don't take out the whole pack of animals. They don't have that kind of power and that kind of strength. They go running after the pack and they look for what will be the greatest opportunity for them at that time to take down. And sometimes you can see in videos, it's really cool to see, sometimes you'll see uh, the herd itself might turn against the lion to resist the lion. And one or more animals will start headbutting it and the lion backs down when it starts to face resistance from the herd. The devil is one, but he is not alone, and there are other evil forces that joined with him in his heavenly rebellion. So smaller, less powerful lions uh, who are still very dangerous, ancient evils with great strength and intellect are also out there seeking to attack and take advantage of weakness. And then on top of these occasional uh, direct intelligent threats, we also have the issue of having a sin nature in our heart, and that is a constant threat against us. And so believers, we need to be on the lookout for when other brothers and sisters are being attacked by the evil one and his minions, and we need to help them out as, as we can. Uh, we have a merciless foe. He doesn't grant respite. He doesn't uh, let people catch their breath before he resumes his attack. And he loves most of all to go after where he sees opportunity that he can make headway with. And so as we are able, I think we as believers need to be trying to lift up other brothers and sisters every day to help them combat that. And cards and calls are a good example of that. Uh, but I'm getting a bit off topic in talking about what we should do toward other believers because this is telling us what we need to do for ourselves. And if you're going to help somebody else, you need to be wearing the armor yourself first. And we are told that we need to be going in the strength of God and in the armor of God. Here's what God says. Verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Verse 11, 
put on the whole armor of God. So the strength is the strength of God. And the armor is the armor of God. And it must be this way for a couple of reasons. One reason, probably the biggest reason, is that the spiritual forces that are against us are called rulers and authorities in the heavenly places or in the cosmos. They're old, they're powerful, they're evil. We've only been alive maybe 80-ish years, the older amongst us. We are not at all equipped in power to combat them in our own power. But, as I said earlier, the devil is not omnipotent. He's very limited. God is omnipotent, and he has no shortcomings, and there is no one who can stand against God. He is infinite, eternal in age and wisdom and power, the creator of all the cosmos, creator of everything, the great expanse of the stars, all of the planets, everything that we don't can't see, he has made. So with God on our side, strengthening us, armoring us, there is no hope for the devil to defeat us. But if we're not walking in his strength, if we're not in his armor, then we're in trouble because he is no weak foe. So God is everything in this battle. Uh, your strength, your shield, your mighty fortress, it must be in his power, it must be in his armor because he has the greatest power, the greatest might. So that's one reason we, we must be walking in his strength and his armor rather than our own. The other is simply just the matter that it's uh, spiritual forces that we're against. Uh, flesh and blood can't touch spirit. You can't push away and punch and shout at and shoot at spirits. And if you do, you'll look like a loon, right? Because you can't hurt those things physically. It takes spirit to, to fight off spirit. Um, so our dependence must be upon God, who is spirit and who is almighty and able to defeat entire armies in heaven and on earth by himself in solo combat. So then what is this armor of God that we are putting on, and what are we to do with the armor? Uh, verse 14 to 17, let's read those again. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So stand in Greek is a command, and it's present tense and it's ongoing. So meaning we're, we're being commanded to always presently, not in the past, not in the future, but right now, just stay in a state of standing ready to resist the evil one. And then after that command, we find... These, these phrases, they sound really a little bit strange in, in English, where it's saying, um, having, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, um, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, that sort of thing. What that is communicating is that these things are to have already been put on. It's called a participle in Greek, and it immediately precedes the, the, the action. And so basically what's being described is, you're to be standing right now, ready for this combat, and you are to be standing in the armor of God. You don't stand up to make the, the defense, to resist in your own strength, and then be like, oh, now, I'm, I, now I need to go put the armor on. Now it's, now it's kind of too late when you've entered into the evil day, and you're standing and you haven't put on that armor, you're in trouble. Uh, because again, we, sir, we fight against merciless foes. I mean, can you imagine just this scenario? You would enter into this life and death scenario with the devil himself trying to tempt you into some evil thing. Is he going to let you say, oh, wait a minute, wait, I haven't got my belt on yet. Let me just, hold on, hold on, let me just go get my belt wrap it on. Oh, wait, my sword. I got to go and get my sword. Nah, he's not going to stand by like, sure, you know, I'll, I'll patiently wait for that. Uh, no, we have to be standing at all times because it could happen at all times and we need to be already in that armor. So this is something that 
You know, if we're not, we're, we're not wearing all these pieces of armor, we're not standing in God's strength as we ought to be, it's something to address in the past. <laughs> we start addressing it even now. Uh, you don't want to march into the battle on the evil day unarmored because we, ser- we fight against pitiless enemies. So the pieces mentioned are the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of spirit. So the belt of truth, um, in ancient warfare, and thinking in particular of Romans, uh, they would wear a belt, and the purpose of the belt was, one, being able to hold their sword. They'd have a little buckle on it so they could put their sword, so they wouldn't drop it if they needed to set it aside for some time. And it would also just help secure everything in place, so in the middle of the combat, their robe isn't kind of fluttering everywhere and they're tripping over it and getting in their way. It just helps everything kind of stay firm, stay stable, stay ready for use. We're told to put on the belt of truth. And so for us as believers, we need to have a grasp, uh, a firm knowledge of what is true and what is not true. And we also need to have truth in our character. Truth is something that will ground us for um, combat as well and help us to always have our sword at the ready to be able to fight the good fight. We as believers need to know what is true and what is not true. And that comes from God's Word. God's Word is uh, without flaw. It is without error. And so we can know that when we are well equipped with it, then we are able to stand in the truth. We're also to have the breastplate of righteousness, and in the ancient times, for most soldiers, this just looked kind of like a metal circle that they had around their chest that was secured via straps. If they were a more wealthy um, soldier, they might be able to afford a bigger breastplate, but for most, it was just kind of a circle that covered uh, the heart area, the vital organs around there. Most of their defense actually came from the shield. We'll get to that in a little bit. So they had this little circle of metal in front of their breastplate to protect the organs there. For us, the breastplate of righteousness, I think that refers to a holy way of life, standing in righteousness, standing in practice, um, doing and obeying the things that God would have us to obey. When we are obeying God, when we're walking in righteousness, walking by His Spirit, uh, we are less susceptible to the attacks of the evil one. The gospel of peace, the shoes that are the gospel of peace. For Roman soldiers, uh, the shoes would help enable them to have a firm stance. And as you can imagine, if you're in the the middle of a fight, the last thing you want to do is accidentally step on a sharp rock on your bare foot. You don't need that that kind of distraction. You don't need your ankle to turn off of some boulder when somebody's in your face with a sword. And so the the shoes ultimately were to protect feet from stepping on something painful, to protect stance so there wasn't any stumbling, any sudden awkward shouts of pain when something unpleasant has been stepped on. They give firmness, stability, a good stand. The gospel of peace, uh, being in the peace of God, knowing the gospel, I think also in a very similar way gives lots of stability, lots of soundness, to our lives. Uh, When we are standing in the gospel, when we're resting in the peace that it grants, it helps us to be stable. I also think a little bit of a verse that says, blessed are the feet of those who bring good news. Um, There is something uh, tying, you know, that message of, of gospel and peace with stability, marching forward, our walk, our stance. Uh, we are to be firmly grounded in God's gospel in order to withstand the efforts of the evil, evil one. Then there's the shield of faith. And as I referenced earlier, that was the primary defense for Romans. They really didn't have a whole lot of large body armor. When you think of medieval warfare, you tend to probably think of that knight in shining armor who's just covered in just straight plate mail. Um, They actually, you can't walk around in that, so they would just seat them on horses. Uh, In the ancient warfare, when they were um, standing around, marching, it it didn't really look that way. They didn't have that kind of armor. They had a very large shield called a tower shield that would go basically from 
their shin, pretty much all the way up to their shoulders that they would hold in front of their person basically at all times. And it helped protect them from uh, arrows, for example. It mentions flaming darts. Darts could be arrows or they could be javelins. They're projectiles uh, of any sort. And the, the Romans had a defensive stance called the tetsudo. It meant turtle. And they would all gather together in this big hunk, and they would hold their shields up in front of them and just kind of march forward. And it was a giant wall of heavy metal, and there was no shield, no arrow, um, nothing that was going to be able to penetrate the strength of this armament with which they would march forward in unity. And I think for us as believers, too, that faith is, is so crucial. Um, it, it's not secondary for us either. We need to have our strong dependence upon, strong faith upon God. And I also, I love that imagery of the Tetsudo shield wall. I think we as believers, an army of believers, do well when we are together in unity, walking, building one another up, walking in the faith, having it forward as our shield. It protects us, and uh, the devil will be looking for openings to take and, and hit with his flaming darts. So we have the helmet of salvation. Roman soldiers, they had a variety of different helmets. One of the more interesting ones, they even had a lion's head that uh, some, of them would, some of them would wear. Different, sometimes a metal cap. If they were really wealthy, they might have a, a full metal helmet. For us, since this is something that we need to actively, this is something that we actively put on, and salvation is something that is imputed to us by God and, and not something that you put on and put off, now, I think it's probably talking about our hope and salvation. With the head being a center for intellect and thought, we are having our hope, our minds set upon and hoping in that salvation that we rest in. And finally, you have the sword of the Spirit. And Roman soldiers actually had two different weapons. They had the, oh, man, what was it? the short Spanish sword, little short sword, I can't think of its name now. And they had a javelin that they would carry. And they launched the javelin just as they were about to enter into combat. And most of their fighting actually took place with the little sword that they had. And they would have the shield in front of them. They didn't wave it around. They just used it for straight jabs like this all the time, just jabbing, looking for openings with their little sword. For believers, we don't have multiple weapons. We don't have the sword and a javelin. We have the sword. Only the sword is mentioned for believers. And this is our only offensive weapon that's mentioned in this armament. And I think... One of the clearest ways to see this in practice is by looking at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. And in fact, I hadn't planned to go there, but let's go there. Let's go look at Matthew chapter 4 and read through it, because um, I think it's so worth seeing what it looks like to wield the sword, which is the Word of God, when faced with the efforts of the adversary. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall not worship, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now you can kind of, as you read through these verses, you can kind of infer and see his strong faith. You can see he's wrapped in truth. You can infer a lot of these pieces of armor that he's standing in. But most clear of all is his use of the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Every uh, temptation 
that that the adversary brings against him, he counters in some way with the Word of God. And sometimes this, this again, this is a merciless guy who will use every means imaginable. He, the, the devil even sometimes takes God's Word and tries to twist and misapply to attack his adversary. Uh, he doesn't use it responsibly and biblically and with respect like Jesus does, and he doesn't always use it like Jesus does, but he's willing to even try to use that against Jesus as he can. But we see Jesus, when he's faced with this adversary, he is wielding this sword. Uh, everything that's coming after him is this Bible verse, no, this Bible verse, no, this Bible verse, no. And we also see, as the devil has been resisted and realized, I'm not going to win, and the devil doesn't have infinite time and attention to focus everywhere on this situation, eventually he says, I'm gone, going away. And that's for us as believers too. The devil, his adversaries, he'll send them after us to try to hurt us, but when we resist, he will flee. Verses 18 to 20, just like we should always be armored, we should also always be praying. So this means we have a state of open communication with God through the Spirit. You know, combat, just thinking in, in terms of the physicality of it, it's not just that. There's also an element of what's going on in your mind. Where are you thinking? Where, what are you latched onto? Who are you communicating with? We're needing as believers to be in a state of open communication with God by the Spirit through prayer. You aren't always going to have something to say to God in prayer um, and we're kind of too limited in our mind to constantly be saying something like this, something like that. More what is being encouraged is, a, is that mindset that's just always ready in all circumstances to bring this matter or that matter to God in prayer. Somebody asks you a question, you say, Lord, how should I answer this question? Something nice happens, you say, Lord, thank you for this blessing. Some fear comes into your heart, you say, Lord, I lay this fear at your feet and trust you to deal with it. It's that kind of mindset that we are to have. Because if we don't have that kind of mindset, then when we face a trouble, when we face something that's hard, instead of talking to God about it, instead of walking in his armor and in his strength, we just try and think things through on our own and, and we panic and we get fearful and we don't do as well as we could have done had, be, had we been walking in prayer. So we shouldn't... Uh, just let prayer be something we only do at meals and at bedtime, which is easy to do. But we should let it be something that happens organically while you're driving, while you are thinking of something nice, while you're enjoying something, while you're stressed, while you're confused. Uh, we should develop that reflex of talking with God. And our prayer should not just be for ourselves. He says, pray also for me. Um, that I may be able to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Wonderful timing. We had a, a missionary presentation just this morning, and they are involved in boldly declaring the gospel. So we don't want to just center our prayers only on ourselves, our own troubles, but we also want to extend them out for others, like the Workman family. Remembering those who are in chains. Prison is real, and there are believers around the world who are in prison, suffering for God's sake. In closing words, he just shares with them how he sent to them Tychicus. I'd love to know what Tychicus had to say to them, but I think that ultimately for today it's, it's not so important and that's why it's not in God's Word. It was just some personal, um, personal encouragement about how Paul was doing. But there, I think there is a lesson to learn here. And Paul sends this fellow Tychicus to them. He says, to inform them, you may know how we are, and to encourage your hearts. And it makes me think of the fact that when believers are discouraged or when believers lack information, the devil is really good at taking advantage of that, isn't he? When there's a lack of information, something is incomplete, the devil loves to kind of supply his own little details to fill in those blanks and cause problems. If somebody is discouraged about something out there, the devil is really able to take advantage of that too. So we as believers want to be looking for opportunity to encourage one another. And then Paul ends with a classic, classic Pauline um, prayers for peace and love and grace to all that hear. Another reminder that we should be praying for and encouraging one another. 
So Ephesians 6, we need to remember we have spiritual forces that are set against us. Just like in the morning, I didn't realize that today was Army Day, when in fact it was Army Day. So we as believers need to realize that every day is Army Day, whether we realize it or not. And if we don't go into Army Day prepared, then our devil isn't, the, our adversary, the devil isn't going to just be nice about it. He's going to attack. We need to go in armored uh, beforehand, standing in not our own strength and armor, but the strength and armor of God. And we pray, add to that prayer for ourselves, but also prayer for others, because others out there need encouragement, uh, need assurance, need prayer, just as much, if not more, than we might need it. All right, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for these powerful, full verses not been able to unpack even um, a portion, just a small portion of, of, of what is in here for us to learn and grow through today. But I do just pray, Lord, you would help us to be walking in your spirit, walking in your strength and in your might in fellowship with you and in prayer. Help us, Lord, to always be ready to resist temptation as it comes, to resist the efforts of the adversary to bring us down. Help us, Lord, to stand united with other believers as well in this endeavor and to look out for one another, to show encouragement and love, and to pray for one another's needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, last week we introduced a new song, and uh, I think it just speaks so well to uh, what I trust each one of our hearts here expresses to an almighty, awesome God. So I want you to just stay seated this morning. And uh, focus in on those words, and uh, we're going to do this uh, one more time. Build my life.
that's the prayer of your heart this morning. You're dismissed. <laughs>